Imagine, if you will, that you are a young woman of royal rank and your father tells you that he is working on a marriage treaty for you. Assuming all goes according to plan, you will be wed to a man from a completely different land, one who doesn't share your background or your faith. And imagine that this land was a place to which civilized people would be, in the words of a later historian, appalled at the idea of going to a barbarous, fierce, and pagan nation. What would your first reaction be? Well, if you were a dutiful daughter of royal rank in the sixth century, you would likely have known your duty and you would have acquiesced. And that, as far as we know, is what the Frankish princess Bertha did. However, despite the fact that the alliance with Ethelbert of Kent was desired by both Bertha's father and by Ethelbert himself, Bertha's agreement to the marriage was not unconditional. Bertha, you see, was a devout Christian. And not only was the place to which she would be going, Kent, pagan, but her husband-to-be was also not a Christian. Oh, the British Isles weren't completely unfamiliar with Christianity in the 6th century. We know that. The faith had been brought to the land centuries before Bertha's life. But the departure of the Romans and the subsequent domination of England by the pagan Anglo-Saxons had largely pushed Christianity to the margins. So Bertha, devout, dutiful Bertha, would be surrounded by pagans in her new home. But Bertha didn't leave her faith behind when she traveled to Kent. Instead, her marriage treaty was conditioned on her absolute right to hold and to practice Christianity. And so accompanied by her chaplain, Bertha brought her beliefs and her practices to Kent. And history records that her husband Ethelbert was true to his word. He had a small church near the castle renovated for Bertha's use as a private chapel. And he didn't interfere when others were drawn to the faith and were baptized. Thus, no doubt because of Bertha's presence and Ethelbert's tolerance, it was to Kent that the missionary Augustine was sent by Pope Gregory in 597. Augustine and his fellow missionaries were charged with bringing Christianity throughout Brit the British Isles, rescuing the faith from the hinterlands to which it had been exiled. Ethelbert, it must be said, wasn't entirely enthused by the presence of Aug Augustine's troop. He made them stay on the Isle of Thanet, east of Kent, until he was certain of their good intentions. But he subsequently relented, giving the mission a building and permission to preach and to baptize freely. In a letter to Queen Bertha, Pope Gregory the Great recognizes her influence and her support of the Augustinian mission, saying, Therefore, our most beloved Lawrence priest and Peter Monk, returning, reported how your glory behaved towards the most venerable brother in our co-bishop Augustine, and with how much attention and what sort of charity you extended to him. And we have blessed Almighty God, who propitiously deigned to reserve the conversion of the race of Angles to your reward. At some point after Augustine's arrival, Ethelbert was converted to Christianity and baptized. Although legend has it that his baptism date was Pentecost of 598, that same letter from Pope Gregory to Bertha indicates that Ethelbert wasn't baptized until some time later. Regardless of the date, however, what is unquestioned is that through Bertha's faithfulness and Ethelbert's openness, new life was breathed into English Christianity. Thousands of Ethelbert's subjects were converted to the faith over the subsequent years of his reign. And while one might cynically assume that those conversions were simply a matter of political expedience or coercion, the Venerable Bede notes in his Ecclesiastical History of the English People that, although the king was pleased at their faith and conversion, it is said that he would not compel anyone to accept Christianity, for he had learned from his instructors and guides to salvation that the service of Christ must be accepted freely and not under compulsion. And of course, although there's no way to be sure, I suspect that the instructor who taught Ethelbert both the love of Christ and the free acceptance of the faith was his own wife, Bertha. By her stalwart devotion to God and Christ Jesus and her willingness to accept for years a husband who was a pagan, Bertha exemplified a life of loving and non-coercive faith. 
So as we remember the brave and faithful Bertha and the wise and generous leader Ethelbert, let us pray. God of creation, who molded humanity from the fertile earth, grant that we, following the good examples of Queen Bertha and King Ethelbert, may gladly receive and fruitfully nurture the seed of the gospel to the bounty of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen.